It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live on Wednesdays at the Ann Arbor District Library, AADL.org, uh, in lovely downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan, on the corner of 5th and William. And uh, this is the live show where we talk about comics, comics storytelling, comics lifestyle. When I say comics lifestyle, I mean like living as a cartoonist. Um, and the show is broadcast live every Wednesday, at, or every other Wednesday now, at uh, comicsagreat.tv. And we got a lot of people in the chat for this episode, and I guess it has to, something to do with the awesome people that we've got, both in studio and on the Skypes. And I'll start with our in-studio guest, our local legend, Katie Cook of katiecandraw.com. I like the term legend. Yeah, you're not real. <laughs> you're like a unicorn. <laughs> I'm lucky to have captured you. I'm, I'm going to take pictures and show it to all my friends. See, she's real. <laughs> I do never leave the house. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I've, I've heard this from some other local guests that I've had on. It's like, uh, I'll thank them you know, profusely for being, thanks for taking time out of your day to be on my show. I'm like, thanks for just getting me out of the house. <laughs> We're going to talk about that a lot today. But let's introduce you to the, the, for the, the six people out there who haven't heard of you. Um, let's see. Star Wars. Star Wars. Fraggle Rock. That's the new big one. Yep. Yeah, ta go to Taco Bell, everybody. Right? Taco Bell books for Fraggle Rock, yay. Um, I also write and draw for Fraggle Rock Comics. Uh, I've done like a one-page story for Marvel that I'll never shut up about. Um, other than that, <laughs> I do some Marvel licensing images. I've done DC licensing stuff. Uh, the uh, 501st Legion of Stormtroopers usually brings you food at conventions. I uh, am an official 501st and level, uh, Rebel Legion member uh, wow. without needing a costume. So they bring me uh, Diet Coke whenever I want. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yes, you're, you, you uh, have tons and tons of sketch cards on your site that mm -hmm. you usually sell by the boatload at conventions. And then there's the Smashy Adventures of the Hulk, which you can read on your site. Yep, and uh, my weekly webcomic, Gronk. Gronk, yes. Gronk, the story of... Uh, a monster who is just too adorable to stay a monster. Yes. So she moves in with uh, what do you call that job? It's a freelance musician. Yeah, she uh, she writes jingles for commercials. Um, you can put the book up on the camera. Um, we can look it's at actually it. uh, based on a, a friend of Ryan's who basically does the exact same thing out of Ann Arbor, and I always thought, oh, that's kind of a weird job. I like it. Yeah. So it's kind of what I do, but with more talent. <laughs> <laughs> weekly weekly web comic at Katie can draw dot com. Actually, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, Gronkcomic dot com. Gronkcomic dot com. Um, but yeah, so you do this on top of all this other licensing work, on top mm -hmm. of writing Fraggle Rock comics. That's a lot of stuff to be doing. Yep. And and we should mention that uh, your uh, I want is it is new mother uh, still is still uh, an she's uh, thirteen months old, so, so. she's she's new ish. She new -ish. does new things every day. So right right. <laughs> but but I bet you're still adjusting. And oh god and now that she's climbing and terrorizing everything it's a big adjustment <laughs> i liked it better when she was a lump <laughs> i could there, get more done there's an old joke on the old uh, sitcom series soap where one of the characters says i love babies or i love children until they can learn to start talking back to me you know well, she already uh, knows no oh uh, yeah yeah toddler years you know, everything's you, you, and that's that's one of the i bring up i bring up grayson because uh you post on your twitter feed and i think it's are you on instagram where do you post these photos instagram. Or just to, yeah uh a couple weeks Weeks ago, maybe a month ago, the most terrifying picture of <laughs> where where Grace was revealing her super villain uh, aspirations with that smile. It, it's still I still see it when I close my eyes. Yeah, she is. She's a piece of work. <laughs> <laughs> so follow Katie Can Draw on Twitter, mm -hmm. KatieCanDraw.com, uh, and then on the you're on the Facebooks and yep. every place else too, right? Okay, so yes, uh, and then Gronk, Gronk the comic. Everybody uh, should be reading that for sure. Uh, so then I turn to our Skype guest. Eisner Award winning, another, uh, this is uh, I think my second or third Eisner guest on the show, uh, Scotty Young of scottyyoung.com. Uh, right now you're working on the Oz book series, yes? Uh, mm -hmm. So you did Ozma of Oz, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, and uh, we're not talking about the prison series, you're talking no. about the L. Frank Baum books, right? <laughs> yeah, we're on, our, we're on our fourth one. Uh, Three of them have been uh, collected in hard covers and soft covers in various forms, and we're midway through Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz, which is the fourth uh, novel. And and uh, you're you're the penciler, inker, colorist of this one. I pencil and ink it. Um, uh, my colorist Jean Francois is uh, he's he's been my right hand man since about 2006 or seven on most of my projects. Um, so he's along for the ride on that, and, and uh, makes me look a lot more talented than I than I 
should uh, ever be so lucky to. I don't know about that because you also are on the Instagrams and Tumblr, and you posted, you've been posting your progress while you're cranking through the latest issue, and you have a whole wall full of these pages. And yeah. that's reason enough to follow you on Twitter, scottyyoung.com, is you actually share the whole progress of the book as it's going. I think that's really yeah. awesome. Thank you. Uh, because, you know, a lot of artists, a lot of times we have to, especially when we're working under contract on something, we have to keep stuff hidden. We can't show it to people until it's done, right? It's under lock and key. The publisher doesn't want the world to see it. But when you actually get to share that procedure like that, it's, it's, yeah. it's really fun to watch. So, uh, yeah, Scotty Young on Twitter. Uh, is it just Scotty Young on Instagram? Too? Yeah, uh, I think so, I, I guess. I think it, I'm so used to just, like, hitting, like, it just goes everywhere. So sometimes <laughs> I just forget what, what title is what, uh you know what I mean. I just hit one button and it just goes to all of them. But I, and I mentioned the the Oz books, but man, man, oh man, I was going through your bibliography and there's just too many books to mention here. I mean, like the the Magneto Not a Hero book that you wrote last year, uh, X Men, uh, the, the that Spider Man book. Oh, what was it called again? Um, it was a uh, Spider Man Legend of the Spider Clan. Yeah, yeah. Legion of Monsters. There's there's a lot of stuff. You've been doing this stuff for Marvel since what 2001, 2000? Yeah, 2001. 2001 was my my first year, and so been been that at Marvel pretty much monthly for ten years now. Wow. Oh, and so Fubar saying in the chat, building a buzz before publication is so important. Do you guys agree with that? Um, oh, yeah. I would agree with it, um, but I mean, I mean, there's different kinds of buzz, right? You can like just do like the teaser image and like coming next year. Like you see like those those trailers in the movies, and it's like a, like a three second trailer that tells you nothing, and it's like coming this year. Or like when Lost was coming out, I remember I was living in the Southwest, and it was just a billboard that just showed the people with no logo, and it just said coming this fall. I was like, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's getting people excited about something that's happening. But uh, but I, I imagine there's got to be some kind of threshold of like how much to share to build that buzz. I don't know. Well, I think there's a difference between um, marketing buzz for a title and uh, just the just the interaction with your fan base. Um, Marvel and Oz and and us as a as a company and a publishing house to to publish Oz. It's, there's one marketing strategy for that, but I think what I try to do outside of that is just interact with as many of my core fan base that I can. Um, and that is sharing a panel here, a panel there, a page there in the progress. Um, and that just kind of, I think, helps build that personal connection that they can get, not only with the, the book that they get to go buy on shelves, but they feel a little bit of a personal connection with the creators of it. And, and, and hopefully you can keep them along for the ride over the years. There are a handful of very, very enthusiastic people in here who are expressing nothing but undying devotion to you, Scotty. So uh, <laughs> apparently there's, there's, there's the proof in the pudding, right? Well, thank you. Uh, there's some people very, very happy to see you on the screen. So, I mean, that, that just goes to show that if you just interact and talk mm -hmm. with people, right? But we were saying also one of the pitfalls is, just before we started recording, is that when you have any kind of constituency, uh, if you get on Skype, you have to set your status to away or offline yeah. because somebody's going to go, hey, <laughs> which is, it, it's awesome that people want to talk to you. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the topic of today, the big the big idea is going to be talking about how to balance your life. And man, my, my G chat or my Skype or if I'm in Google Plus and like somebody just pings me like, hey, can we talk? No, I'm in the middle of something right now. You know, I got to get a lot of stuff done today. Right. I mean, it really helps if you have no life. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no social life to speak of. <laughs> like, like yeah. you, you go out every once in a while. I saw you tweeting about actually getting to hang out with David Peterson. And oh, I, I, uh, I see David Peterson and Jeremy Bastian and Nate Pride every week. Okay. Um, I, I set one day a week aside to go draw and you know with hang buddies. out with like-minded people and. Mm -hmm. Because if I didn't have that, I would go completely insane. I would have no hair right now. <laughs> I, <laughs> You'd become I, the crazy cat lady? I would be peeing myself and talking in grunts. <laughs> it, and it would just completely break down into like some kind of hoarders-esque A&E type show. It would, it'd be bad. Uh, yeah, I was, I was talking with uh, somebody recently who uh, I wanted them to come do an event at AADL on a Sunday. And they said, no, Sunday is my day. Nobody gets that day. And I stick to that. And I thought, wow, you know, there's, sometimes we, we cartoons, at least, at least I fall victim to this, is like that uh, machismo kind of pride of I work 16 hours a day, seven days a week. Nobody works harder than me, right? But th there's a burnout that happens if you do that too much. And maybe it's a good idea to give yourself one day for socializing, mm -hmm. being around your, your peers, and not be focused on a deadline or anything like that. You need that recharge time, right? Yep. Um, 
<laughs> and people are also posting in the chat about the the daily or the the warm up sketches that you do, Scotty. Uh, the the Zim sketch and then the Mario sketch. Yeah, this is another thing we should mention is that you also do uh, warm up sketches that you sell uh, on. Is it through Big Cartel that you're using? Yeah, I just use a Big Cartel storefront. Yeah. Yeah, it's super easy to use, isn't it? I yep, mean, you that's have what one I too. Use. Yeah, that's yeah, what that's in order to Daily sketches are so much fun. Yeah, Thank they, they totally are. Uh, but okay, so another thing we got to mention is, and this will lead into our big idea topic is, Scotty, you just moved. You just moved. Uh, what about a month ago? I moved two months ago. It's been about two, 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 two and a half months. Yeah. Uh, and you moved while deadlining books. I moved. You know what? I moved while deadlining books, and um, my father passed away about two weeks after we moved. Yeah. So uh, it was a. Cr th this past two months has been uh, crazy. <laughs> So yeah. it's it really uh, that kind of stuff piles up pretty fast um, while trying to move and do books and but you know you do it you figure out, you figure out a way. But I mean, I'm reminded of you guys have seen or at least heard of that uh, Kirby biography, the Kirby King of Comics by Mark Evanier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and in that they talk about like when Kirby had to move from New York to California for health reasons. It's like the art desk was the last thing put on the truck and the first thing taken off. And while his family was unpacking and, <laughs> and setting up the house, he was at the art desk. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. and, and I'm sure you guys have been there, right? Mm -hmm. It's like that's one of the sacrifices you have to make is that you put, put in some long hours and, and life stuff kind of it has to fall on the spouse or other family members while you're hunched over the art desk, right? Uh, well, just over Christmas, uh, we went down to uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, where Ryan's parents now live. Uh, they just moved there, and I took work. Yeah. I mean, we were down there for a week, and you know, while they're all doing Christmas stuff, I was sitting there at a kitchen table. I was like, oh, I got to have these stupid cards done by yep, yep. the 28th. Who, who puts a deadline the day after Christmas? Uh, <laughs> art directors? No. <laughs> and uh, and just uh, last week, my dad had a fall and had to have his knee replaced. Oh and now gosh. all of a sudden, I'm like a week behind uh, <laughs> everything. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I remember when I was moving cross country once, uh, this would be around 2000, I was deadlining a book for Antarctic Press. And I was in on Christmas, we were moving the, the week after Christmas. And I'm at my in-laws house and I have a big clipboard on my lap and I'm drawing pages. And my father-in-law says to me, is like, nobody works on the holidays. I'm like, yeah, yeah, we do. We don't, we don't get paid vacations, you know? So, and, 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 you know, a monthly schedule has to be met however you make it. Right. But, but I mean, but you got to find a balance somehow. And Scott, you were talking about, you just make it work. One of the things that I was really gripped by was on your blog at scottyyoung.com. Uh, it was uh, the 2012 manifesto that you wrote. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if you could go into that a little bit because there was a lot of really great thoughts in there about something we cartoonists have to do all the time since we are working on a freelance schedule and we have to manage our own schedule. We don't have a boss. We have art directors and we have editors who are going, hey, where's the thing? But they're not with you every day because you're working from home most of the time, right? So it's on you to manage that schedule, right? And then on top of that, you want to do passion projects. You want to do things that are personal to you, like Gronk, like you know, like the the, the comic that you were doing. Um, oh, I want I want to make sure I get his name right. Scott Morse, uh, when you were mm -hmm. doing Scatterwood, you know, yeah. you want to do these little personal projects. How do you manage that? Plus your family, plus your online presence, plus meeting your deadlines. So I wonder if you just get. I thought the great kickoff would be uh, your 2012 manifesto. If you could summarize that. Yeah, it really was just a situation where I, you know, 2011 came and all these plans and ideas were, were in place and um, I closed my eyes and opened them up and all of a sudden we're talking about 2012 mm -hmm. and this list of things uh, that were supposed to get, get accomplished from 2011 were all started and, and many uh, were not, not fulfilled. Now, I mean, uh, so, so really I just, I, I was frustrated with myself um, it, but not overly harsh. I, you know, I, I got to keep perspective as well. I still create a monthly book. Um, I just have a two-year-old. So, I mean, I'm by no means, uh, you know, like downing, being too down on myself because I still accomplish a lot, a lot, a lot. But I, I feel that I finally have um, got my schedule to the point where I can do the deadline stuff on a nine-to-five schedule almost daily and not not really have to go outside of that. So, um, really it's more, it was less about trying to manage myself time-wise and more about trying to convince myself to just follow through with one of my other, you know, I have all these passion projects and it seems like, um, I start them and then 
I'll either figure out a way to think that I can make it better and restart or put it on pause or I think of another idea, you know, and, and there's, I don't know what it is with me lately where I'm just, uh, I'm just not completely pulling the trigger. So the manifesto was, it was more a way of me saying, all right, I'm not going to talk about things any, you know, cause I, part of my thing was I'll start talking about it a lot. I'll, 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 I'll give you the progress. I'll show you this. I'm going to build it. And cause I would think that would keep me in check. Like you guys will be my police. That did not work. <laughs> I, I did not feel policed, even if uh, even when people asked me for it. So um, it really was just a way of saying, you know what, I'm going to try to buckle down this year, but I'm just going to kind of keep my mouth shut while I do it, and 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 uh, and not get everybody's hopes up and down, and my hopes up and down. And then the more I talk about it and don't fulfill it, the more I then I am harsh on myself. So you know. It's all those things we all go through as cartoonists, you know? You know, but, but what I want to jump on that I think is so interesting that you mentioned there is, you know, I do a lot of teaching. I teach a lot of comics workshops in the southeast Michigan area, and I get asked by a lot of teenagers who are going off to college, what do I got to do to be professional? Then they say to me, all I want to do is just stay home and draw all the time. And, and they have this gleam in their eye that I remember having when I was 16 and 17 years old. of Like, that's going to be the greatest. I'm just going to eat candy and watch rated R movies and, and draw all day. And I'll never have to worry about anything ever again. It's going to be like playtime all the time. And then when I say, well, no, there's a lot of stuff that you have to handle, and you're going to have to manage your taxes, and you're going to have to get insurance, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but th th what I'm getting at here is that they have this idea that it's, it's just – like once you get there, well, you need to talk about breaking into comics, right? Yeah. How do you break in? And then once you're broken in, you don't got to worry about it anymore. I'm just a comics artist, and now I don't have to think about this stuff anymore. Just do stuff. But here you are, Eisner winner. And you're beating yourself up about what you're not getting done. It's which, yeah. like, all the all the, the aspiring creators are like, shut up, Scotty. Dude, you, you've done a lot of cool stuff, but you said yourself, right? It's yeah. like, yeah, like, I know I accomplished stuff, but there's always that sense of, but I could do just this much more. I could do just this much more. And I got all these exciting ideas, and they're so exciting, and I just got to tell somebody about them, right? I mean, well, yeah, I mean, it's it's like anything else. I mean, if you play basketball and you're on a team and you, and you guys, you know, you go out and you play a game and you win that game, you don't just stop. You know, yeah. you go and you play another game and you play another game after that. And you might lose some games and you'll win some more games, but you still will play game after game after game. And I feel like that's kind of the same way. It's um, if I accomplish one thing, I want to accomplish it a little bit better next time or I want to accomplish a new thing, you know, where 10 years ago when I started at Marvel, I was just a penciler. And then I was a penciler inker. Then I was a penciler inker colorist. And then I was writing my own stuff. And now I'm writing stuff for other artists. And yeah. so... Every, you know, it's like every year I want to try to, I, I attempt to try to do something more, learn something more. So in another 10 years, it, you know, m the hopes are, will be, I'll be my own island and be able to, t you know, that'll be the function over and over and over. So it's, it's really trying to talk myself into uh, being okay and pulling the trigger more often. On your on your website, Scotty, there's a FAQ where you really you answer the question, and I'm I don't know if there's one on yours, Katie, but I'm sure you get this question a lot. Where the the person comes up and says, "What does it take to be a comics artist?" And Scotty, you, you kind of like nip that one in the bud by putting a paragraph saying, "Okay, here's what you need to know. Here's like the the brass tacks of what you need to know to be a comics artist." So now you don't have to email me about this anymore, right? right? <laughs> uh, I, I'm just getting to the point in my career where I'm starting to get those questions a lot. Where it's like, "Could you help me become a comics artist?" Well, you know, and uh, and it, there's always this sense of What's the secret? What's the special words that you say out loud and then the, yeah. the wizard comes and poof and now you're, you're a professional. Uh, but what you're talking about, and gosh, Katie, I mean, you've got to, I'm sure you could speak to this, is you're talking about motivation, right? Mm -hmm. Motivation to not just be satisfied with one thing, like always taking on a new thing and always looking for the next new thing. Motivation, I think, is probably the number one element that you need in order to do this thing on a regular basis with any kind of uh, expertise, right? Well, you have to be motivated because everything is on deadline. <laughs> yeah. And if you miss a deadline, then all of a sudden everybody doesn't think you're a professional and they don't call you back. Right. Um, but but also, like, uh, motivation to, to take on new projects and yeah. try new things, right? Because, yeah. like, how did you get the Henson job? I'm sure it wasn't just, like, somebody called you up and said, Katie, guess what? You know, you, you're just so awesome that we just noticed you from afar and here's the thing. Like, you have to go hunting for this stuff, too, Actually, right? Actually, that's what <laughs> Um <laughs> But uh, but for but other that, things, but that I took, go after it. But it's, that was based on a lot of work yeah. that you did, well, it's, right? Well, it, it is very common knowledge online that I'm a Henson fanatic yeah. um, and that Fraggle Rock is something that I know way too much about. And um, I already had some Fraggle Rock pieces up on my site that I had done. 
And, you know, I got the call and it was like, all right, great. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote uh, a six page story in one volume. I wrote a 20 page story in another one uh, that involved a, a character named Cantus that they, Henson wasn't actually letting anybody use because that was one of Jim's characters. Mm -hmm. But they liked my script enough that I, I wrote something for that character that they said felt like an episode that Jim would have written. So. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a crowning wow. achievement. Wow. Wow. Um, what a thing to hear. Yeah, I printed yeah, that email out. That, one, that went up right? on the fridge. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, but no, there are other projects that when you hear about something that you want to work on, go after it. Yeah. Do, whip up a sample. If you see a license, um, so-and-so company got the license for this. It's like, I want that. Mm -hmm. Maybe they don't have anybody yet. Whip up a sample. Send a pitch. Um, I'm writing a pitch right now for a company that I can't mention what it is, but I was asked to write and I have never considered myself a writer and I'm getting asked to write two 88 page graphic novels for something. It's funny how like the last two decades or five, maybe six decades of comics in the United States has conditioned people who draw to not consider themselves writers. I, I was just yeah, I was watching a, something the other day that threw me into that exact same frame of thought how I think it was it, Frank Miller been, may have been talking about in an interview, and, and he, even he was like, uh, you know, just saying, "Oh, well, I just decided to try to make them let me write or whatever." And I thought it's so odd that we, as as artists, autumn or, or somebody was reviewing. I think even Magneto, and and and, and, not, and there was a nice review, but it's it's interesting to see the shock if people actually like your writing, <laughs> because all of a sudden it's like. Well, if I'm pretty good with this, and I've been doing that for like, and I can tell a story visually, chances are, I'd probably be at least decent at the other side of telling a story. Now, not great, and and there'll be there'll be some learning, but it is it is, but yet then the person who can't draw at all, if they just say I'm a writer, we automatically go. Oh well, you're good at writing, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right, and, and, and it's funny, you know. Like one of the theses that I always explore in my workshops with with adults and kids is that no, you're writing with images here. You know, it's like when you decide whether you show that guy far away or close up, that's a writing choice. Whether you decide if that's a tall panel or a wide panel or whatever, a round panel, that's a writing choice because you're trying to affect the reader's imagination with that. Um, but that, you know, it's weird that that still that idea of artist writer division mm -hmm. still permeates, uh, at least in the United States, yeah, right? Well, it's I got an email from someone that uh, they were giving me a compliment on my Gronk web comic and they said, you've written such a great character. And right. that made me think I was like, I did what? Yeah, yeah. You drew it. But, but, see, but see, I think but maybe part of that comes out of the fact that for us, because we're cartoonists, writing and drawing are so in they're so intertwined mm -hmm. like where when are you writing when are you drawing right well no it's the same activity and so we need another mm -hmm. word for it almost because it's hard to pull the two apart you know i don't know but yeah i bet it's it's tricky to make that step I, i'm wondering if both of you guys can speak to this as a cartoonist to go to writing a script for somebody i bet that's got to be a whole different yeah, well, ball of cognitive wax when i when i wrote the 20 page story for fraggle rock and i had to turn in the script before anything else because yeah. I, I do everything. I th have it in my head, and then I just kind of thumbnail it out. Yeah. And I have really crappy thumbnails, and then I just kind of <laughs> write in, I guess someone will say something like this, and someone will say something like this. Yeah. But I had to type it. Yeah. So, I mean, it was me staring at a screen, and I was like, uh, yeah. I guess this happens on page six. Yeah, yeah. And it's on this panel. All right. That, that's how it goes, right? I, I did a book for Glencoe McGraw Hill where they wanted a full script, and I'd never written full script. I always worked thumbnail to pencils and mm -hmm. inks. And so I had to do the thumbnails and then reverse engineer it back to a script for them. And it was a lot of work, but that's the way they wanted it, you know? Are, are you doing script styles? Oh, wait, you're working for Marvel, so you're probably doing it a little bit of a different style, Scotty. Well, a lot of people will say, you know, bring up that Marvel style, but that. That that old plot Marvel style hasn't really been used. In a, I mean, honestly, the fir my first year in comics was the last year of that. My first script that I ever drew was that old Marvel plot style, and then after that, it's basically been full script for everybody. Oh wow! Um, so it's uh, for for the writing stuff for Magneto and some of the X Men short stories that I've written. Um, they're they're full scripts, and and I thought that it would be more of a jolt than it was. Um, and I, I think just after drawing a hundred comics over the years, you um, you just know the beats and that you kind of get the rhythms of this many pages. It's gonna be this many pages. So um, 
again, I'm still learning that stuff, but it, it wasn't as scary. In fact, there were times where I was like, yeah, the, these, uh, these writers have this game figured out because uh, I got to just do this and then walk away, right? Like, yeah. all of a sudden, like <laughs> what, what, what usually happens is you get an idea and then I have to spend two or three days bringing it to life on paper and here I had an idea and I was done in about 45 seconds because it's like, Oh really? He's going to lift up all the cars and aim them at the mansion. Yeah. There it is. That's done. I don't have to draw any of it. So, um, you know, it, it, uh, but you know, I will say that knowing the, the, the talent level of clay man on that is, issue and, and, and the, the artists that have drawn my other books, um, when you know that you have such a good support system there, it also makes that job a lot easier, you know, because you you know that they're going to take care of it and handle it. You're, they're going to bring your idea to a whole nother level, um, just like I, I hope or try to when I'm an artist for somebody else's script. So um, it's definitely it, it's definitely fun. I mean, I've really enjoyed that transition. Yeah, that's another thing that, you know, when people talk about, uh, it reminds me of the whole argument against inking. We don't need inkers anymore because, hey, we got this great thing called levels in Photoshop. But I like to work with inkers occasionally because I like the collaborative thing that happens when they go do something with that line. And I go, hey, I, did, I wouldn't have done that, but that's nice. That brings a whole new, it's like a band, you know, uh, the assembly yeah. line team, it, because it's not as necessary anymore, it becomes more like uh, how a band works and like the Traveling Wilburys kind of thing, right? Well, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes that, I think sometimes um, people can get very precious about their comic book work and want to, to do it all themselves. And, and sometimes that takes a long time, but Sometimes I try to re even even myself I, I I wanted to start taking control of my colors because I wanted the con colors to look this way, and I got very controlling over it. But instead, what I slowly started to do was put together a team that brought the world that that had a vision similar to me, but could do things that even passed my abilities. And and I look at it like movies. You know, no one person walks in with a camera and an editing bay and the special effects and does it all themselves. It's a team. It's a collection of talents. And I think that's a fun, fun uh, process to see, you know, once I finish penciling and inking and, and I send my pages off to Jean, I think, oh, they're going to figure me out on this one. Like, I'm really cutting the corners. And then Jean sends it back to me and I'm like, he made me look like a gene. <laughs> <laughs> It's, just, it's pretty awesome. Uh, well, cool. I want to. I want to talk. I, I promised everybody that we were going to talk about lifestyle and balancing your lifestyle and balancing between personal life, passion projects, and uh, you know, paying gigs. Uh, I have a hard one. I have, a, I have a tricky question. I'll start with now that we're all warmed up. Uh, when do you know when you're ready? So going off of your 2012 manifesto, Scotty. Yeah. When do you know that it's time to announce a personal project? When do you know that you're ready? I mean, there's like common wisdom that gets thrown around, like don't announce your webcomic until you got a buffer of eight weeks or whatever. Uh, but, you know, buffers come and go. Uh, development of an idea, it, 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 it's, a, it's a squishy, spongy thing, you know? When do you know that it's baked? Do you guys have any thoughts I, on this? I'll give you mine. And for me personally, I, I mean, I don't think it's a blanket rule because I think it really just goes to each individual's follow through. I mean, if in your life you announce, some, you know, you say you're going to do something and you do it all the time, announce as soon as you have the idea, whatever. For me, I've found that with, for some reason, with this comic book stuff, it's like I don't do, it's like nothing else in my life. It's like I announce it and then I fall victim to that. Um, I'm going to back up. I read one time with uh, in a writing book, I, I forget who said it, but they said, don't, if you have a story idea, do not share it. Don't tell anybody. Just do it. Write it, draw it, whatever. Because the minute you start sharing it with one person, your brain is telling you you've told your story. Mm. As storytellers, we just want to tell our story. And if I tell you my story, then I've done my job. And, and I truly believe that's been my biggest problem is I, I feel accomplished because I've told people my story. <laughs> I tell my dog my story. I tell my friend, you know, I get on the Skype with Jason Howard and I tell him my story. And I tell Ryan Stegman my story. And all of a sudden, my brain is going, well, okay, we don't have to do that now. <laughs> we told our story. Right. And, and I really think that's been one of my biggest problems is through the process of sharing the creative experience as I'm creating the story, I get about two months in of the creation and my brain goes, well, we've accomplished that. <laughs> and then I, I back off. So for me, 
I'm at a place where I'm no longer announcing anything until I'm like two and a half biscuits away from being done with it. <laughs> yeah, Scott Yoshinaga of Nemu Nemu, nemu nemucom is in the chat, and he says, we usually don't announce things until it's almost done. So yeah, there's somebody else backing up on that. Katie, you got any? Um, well, it's when I started Gronk, um, you have to understand, I have had the idea for Gronk as a character since 2000. I mean, I was in high school. Even in, a, in my book, I have one of the very first sketches that oh, I did wow. of her back when I couldn't draw. But but you did a turnaround. See. I want to see. Yeah, hold it up so Scotty can see. I don't know if this is going to show up on your screen, Scotty. Yeah, I can see it. Awesome. But uh, then all of a sudden, because uh, I've been doing the, the strip for almost two years, I was going through sketches of, you know, all of this stuff stuff that I just had with this character, like kids' books ideas and this and that. And I was like, this is dumb. Why am I not doing anything with this? So I drew the first comic. I put it up online. And I said, well, now i got to do this every week. <laughs> and I haven't missed a week, um, except for I, uh, I was out for two weeks when I had my baby. And even By then, way, I, had okay. backup, <laughs> I, had, I had backup strips planned. So I ran guest strips. Um, the whole time, but I don't have buffer t strips. I never have. I uh, I set a few hours a week aside every week, and that's that's my me time to draw. But uh, right now, the strip that's going up Friday, I haven't drawn it yet. Yeah, I don't even know what I'm gonna do. That's and that can actually be kind of awesome sometimes, can't it? Because like, well, I mean, it's well, it's it's a rolling of the dice. Like I, I run into this with some things that I work on, uh, where I'll sit down and I'll have the blank sheet of paper, and I'm like, okay, I don't know what I'm gonna do today, and then I'll get halfway through, and I'm like, oh, this is terrible. I'm the worst cartoonist I've ever lived. I'm a hack after all. And then I'll get to the end, and it'll kind of pull itself together, mm -hmm. and I'll be like, I'm a genius. I'm the greatest guy who ever lived. And I'll run around the house like Rocky Balboa, mm -hmm. even though it's not that great, you know. But that, that's that privilege as cartoonists, right? <laughs> well, it's it can be annoying because I mean, I have I'm on deadline for like three different projects right now because uh, besides doing comics, I also do a lot of uh, license art art and mm -hmm. production work but now it's like oh I probably should work on that and not draw the strip but if I don't update on Friday then I missed a week and I'm a terrible person and I don't yeah. know if anybody reads this anyway um, so is this is this something we all suffer from is that kind of like manic depressive guy music from the Muppets smashing his head into the piano when it doesn't work for him do we all do this oh yeah I don't, yeah mine is I'm, I, I, I again I, I'm in the middle of this like uh, Anybody who knows me knows that I'm not, uh, I'm never really down on myself. I'm like, in fact, the, some people probably could, could, could lean towards the disliking me for maybe the fact that I like <laughs> myself a little too much. Um, so that's why I'm in the middle of this like introspective, like what is going on in my brain that is uh, stopping me. And, and I am hitting that place where it goes back to that writer artist thing, right? Over the last 20 years, we've all convinced ourselves that we're just this one thing and we, we get put in this, in this corral over here. Well, I feel like, I think I fall victim to that wanting to overcome that so much that when I'm trying to craft my story, that I'm trying to craft such a story that your face will literally break <laughs> when you read it, right? <laughs> like, like it will break your neck <laughs> You'll just be like, oh, my God, I can't believe this was created. And so I always start, and then I'll be like, well, this isn't that level yet, which is silly because I don't act like that with anything else in my life. You know, like my in my Marvel work, I do the best job that I can in the time allotted, and then you have to move on because there's another page to do, and there's another page and another book and another book. And also, so for 10 years, I've had the right mentality when it comes to their stuff. But when it comes to my stuff, I'm almost, I need to let go of this preciousness that I've built up in my head somehow. And, and, and I had a good uh, conversation with Doug Tenapel uh, a couple, or last week. And, and he finally still kind of rattled me loose a little bit. It was kind of like, same thing. Like, you allow yourself this freedom and, and fun to be had on these other jobs because it's not yours. So there's no fear in, in hurting it. Because it just goes away when it's done. And it was like, you just need to treat your own work like you don't care about it. You know, like, let, let it go. And, it, and I kind of really need to do that. I need to be okay with the fact if I put this out and people go, oh, well, Scotty Young's an artist. And he just wrote a book that basically an artist would, you know, write because it's just cool images with words in it, you know. I need to be okay with that. And, I, you know, yeah. so that's, that's where I am. And I think that's, that's the big thing holding me back, I believe. 
No, I, th this is one of the things that uh, we had a brief email exchange about, and I don't want to go into it deeply, uh, but I just conquered this myself. I was thumbnailing a personal project, and I was starting, uh, I, I thumbed the first act four times because it's my babies, it's my characters, I want it to be right, and then I realized I'm not getting anything done because I'm just rewriting and rewriting. Let's just get yeah. the damn thing done, right? Yeah. And then I got through act two, and then I'm like, okay, this isn't too bad. I got through act three, and then I stepped back and went, okay, now I've got something that I can edit. I got something that I can work with here, but... There was a real, real sense of fear in, in like, why? Who cares? Nobody cares about these characters. Nobody's reading this book. Uh, I, I just need to get the thing done to my satisfaction and not be so scared of uh, people are going to say, like, oh, Jersey Joe's his baby. is not such a pretty baby. Yeah. You know, yeah, but yeah, it is yeah. to me, you know, so. I mean, are you guys familiar with Doug Tenaple's work? Oh, oh yeah. 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 Iron I mean, West. He does, like, a graphic novel or two a year. Yeah. Like, like clockwork. Like, it's nothing. <laughs> And yeah. it's just like, I want to like bottle up that whatever kind of manic, crazy man energy that that guy has and just like drink it in my coffee or something. <laughs> <laughs> and well, and Katie too. I mean, you know, Katie's the same way. She's doing the job and the family and the kid and then a Gronk is coming out. You know, it's coming mm -hmm. out. She, she's doing it. I mean, I was online talking about my webcomic launching at the same time. And since then, I've had 75 different webcomic <laughs> launches. <laughs> You know what I mean? And Katie's just like, me and Katie were both like, I think like two years ago, like, I don't know, should we use WordPress? Should we use Yeah, we were. But, uh, and yeah, and I don't, I'm with my kid all day. I'm like, I'm a stay at home mom during the day. And the second Ryan comes home, that's when I shift into artist mode or when she takes a nap. So, I mean, I have to time manage really well. That's what I wanted to ask you guys next is that you guys are talking about, okay, you got these projects where it's like, get it done, get it done, get it done mm -hmm. and do it well, right? Mm -hmm. You guys aren't slackers. You're not dogging it. But, man, you know, as a guy who used to work a full-time job and do freelance illustration and try to do a webcomic on top of everything else, there were days where it was like, whew, I got to spend four hours at the desk on my own thing in order to keep my own deadline, and I'm spent. How do you guys manage your energy between these different things? I mean, because this has got to be analogous to somebody who is working a day job that maybe they like or they don't like, uh, and they're trying to get this comics thing going, and they come home, and they're beat. I mean, how do you guys, like you said, you kick into artist mode. What do you, well, how did you get to that? Or is that something that well, just came natural to you? Well, it's it's considering I was doing it for five years before then. Um, I had a day job uh, here in Ann Arbor. I worked at a studio. Um, I did paper and stationery design. And then at the same company later, I did toy design. I did stuff for Build-A-Bear and Crayola and Disney princesses. And I would spend all day doing that. And then I would come home and work. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, I decided I'm going to quit my job. I'm doing well enough. I'm going to quit my job. And the second I uh, decided to quit my job, I found out I was pregnant. <laughs> and I was like, oh, God, I'm still quitting. Okay. Um, but no, and, and now it's, it's, it's that shift of I'm a mom. I love being a mom. My, my kid is the best thing in my life. But I don't get as much done as I would like sometimes. Uh, so I just I transition. It's the second Ryan gets home, I, I shove her in his arms and is like, you put her to bed. And I go down to my studio and I work until I until I'm done, and then all weekend I work. Mm -hmm. Weekends are are my work time. Uh, I don't I don't see my kid during the weekend. <laughs> and so wow. I will hear her the pitter patter of her footsteps upstairs, and every once in a while I'll hear her fall. So I run upstairs and it's like, what happened? Uh, but other than that, it's it's I I time manage. I I'm a list maker. Mm. I have lists everywhere. I have. Uh, my Google Calendar open with these deadlines, and then on my iPad I have the list of stuff that's getting done this day. On my left hand I have like these five emails that I haven't responded to yet. Uh, so <laughs> there's that. Yeah, so. yeah. So again, it comes to down to like that motivation again, mm -hmm. right? So it is fun. Mm -hmm. it, it's 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 a great line of work, but. It requires that kind of laser beam focus and motivation to want to do it all the time and force yourself to want to do mm -hmm. it, doesn't it? Because sometimes you have to draw stuff you don't want to draw. Yeah. I have to, I drew like... like when Scotty tells you to draw like the thing lifting 500 cars, or no, Magneto lifting 500 cars and I'd throwing them at a so building. I'd be so mad at a writer that <laughs> gave me a crowd scene every page. I'd be so mad. Yeah, I, I remember uh, I worked with Tom Root uh, on a miniseries for an Arctic Press uh, called PPV, and he said, uh, panel one, six panel scene, uh, all the students who disappeared throughout the series suddenly reappear on the, on the the campus grounds, and I just wrote them a note like, "You're killing me. Knock it off. Don't do this to me anymore, man." Uh, but that's a writer's prerogative, right, Scotty? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, how do you manage your energy? I mean, how do you? Is you got a kid too? Yeah, I have a two-year-old. Um, 
Casey's at home uh, during the day with him, and, and uh, we got the two dogs and the whole nine. So um, I'm a pretty energetic person to begin with. Um, I everything's, everything's all a head game, right? I mean, when, when people work normal nine to fives, they get off at five. Um, they don't come home and just sleep, right? They come home, they do the family, they do the business, and then they'll go out and work on cars or – uh, plant flowers or any of those extra things that give them joy, uh, you know, go play basketball or whatever. They're, because in their head, even though they're, they're tired from the day job, all their head, their mind is like switching over to fun time. We just are lucky enough that what we do during the day for work is also what we, it, it is also the car that I will work on when I go home. So, the energy is there to do something. I'm going to do something with it. I'm not going to ever just go home and sit. Mm -hmm. um, it's just lucky enough that when Baxter goes to bed at eight, you know, which he's, I'm really lucky to have a kid that goes to sleep like clockwork, right? <laughs> he's like super sleeper. Um, so when he goes to bed at eight, I know that I have, you know, from eight to whatever midnight, we usually go to bed 11 or 12 to, uh, to do a little writing, to do a little sketching, to do a little developing or whatever. Sometimes I do it at home. Sometimes I'll come back to the studio. Um, but it's really just, it's all mental. I think it is. You know what I mean? You're just convincing yourself, hey, I'm going to do something. Might as well do this. You know, like I, I'm in that place where I'm 33, almost going to be 34 in a, in a month or so, you know, where I'm like, I've got this window right now that I have the energy, I have the drive. Let's try to do as much as I can. <laughs> before I turn 40 and all yeah, of my, my joints. Before I start losing some of that. Or I also know, too, I mean, my son is two, and sooner or later he's going to be five and six and seven, and then I'm going to be at practices and sleepo and camps and blah, 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 you know. So I'm trying to, like, shove as many things into as many hours as I can right now while he doesn't know. <laughs> you know, I, I see I get him out of bed every morning. I come home, I eat dinner with him every night, I put him to bed every night, and in between those times, I do my best to just to like keep that energy going because, you know, there there's definitely a motivation like the hunter gatherer motivation when you have a, a stay at home mom on your side and you're the provider. So I'm trying to be creative, I'm trying to be artsy, and I'm also trying to like go out and kill kill that deer and bring it home. You know? <laughs> Uh, so, so again, you know, it, it sounds like, uh, both of you have kind of hinted at, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, uh, this idea of tricking yourself into staying positive about it. Now, it doesn't sound like you guys give yourself much time to like really beat yourselves up too much about this stuff and just keep fighting the fight. Right. I was yeah. Gonna say, yeah. It's, well, it's, Go ahead, Katie, I'm sorry. well, it's, I was just going to say it's, I, I stay positive just for the, the sappy fact that I'm a positive person, um, for the most part, don't read too much into my tweets when I get really <laughs> negative about my child. Um, so when she says she hates her life and family, <laughs> right? It's not real. It's when when Katie real. says I want to decide who lives and who dies, <laughs> no, that part's true. But no, it's um. I mean, have you have you seen my artwork? It is. Yes. I'm in a happy place most of the time. I mean, I I love my life. I love my family, and the fact that you know I've been full-time freelance for well over a year um i mean this is i am really lucky to do this for a living so it's mm -hmm. it's pretty hard for me to get down on myself just because oh i have deadlines boo-hoo i have work <laughs> yeah. i mean i can't that's a good problem i have, can't yeah. bitch about that online people would lynch me <laughs> <laughs> well some people do anyway though you know but well, I, I think the like that finding that the constant trying to find a crack in the wall and put your chisel in it and break down that wall that's like a young man's game for me like i can't like there's too many great things out there that i could be talking about or achieving or anything for me to take even 2 seconds and and try to expose something else or even myself you know what i mean like there's no like what a, there's not much to achieve by telling myself i failed there's definitely not much to achieve by telling Twitter or Facebook or my blog that I've, I've failed. Now, again, my manifesto says that I failed at my, some of my goals. <laughs> but keep in mind, I mean, I achieved a hell of a lot last year. Yeah. A heck of a lot. I know we're, we're – sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Uh, uh, I, you know, I achieved a, a lot last year. But I had very lofty expectations of myself. So 
not walking around beating myself up or looking for the flaws in the comic book industry or looking for the flaws in distribution. Blah, blah, blah. Like that really gets me nowhere. It doesn't, you know, but walking around telling myself like, yeah, this was a good day. This was a, this was a positive idea. Uh, that book is great. It's like sharing all that kind of stuff with other people. I feel like then the circle starts to become positive and you start to start, you start to get to meet people like Katie, you start to meet people like, and, then all of a sudden you've got this great support system that hopefully then will keep you motivated and keep you building. Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's a lot of fun watching. I feel like this a lot. I'm <laughs> noticing now that I'm looking at myself on a camera. It's kind of bizarre. Very visual in your communication. But I mean, there's yeah. there's so many good things in comics right now that it's it's kind of pointless to just complain about all the negative stuff because. You know, we have this great new frontier with the iPad and all this digital publishing. There's people putting out amazing books right now. Like, Archaea is putting out oh, amazing awesome. books. Tale of Sand is mm -hmm. beautiful. And it's, the fact that right there. Uh -huh. it's, it's like one of the best books ever yeah. put on paper. And people are putting out comics right now that are amazing and I think really pushing us into this dawn of well-crafted, amazing books that are going to put us more in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And to sit back and go, I didn't like Jughead number five last yeah. week, is really just step back. That's Yeah, yeah. It, it, they, they're becoming an anachronism, that, that character, aren't they? Mm -hmm. You know, the whole, uh, thank you for answering my question, sir. I would like to say that if all of your comics were about villains, they'd be primo. You know, that kind of thing. Well, it's because I got an email a few weeks ago from someone going, your webcomic is not my taste. Mm -hmm. And it was like, wow, you took the time to write that? Yeah. <laughs> it was like, I just wrote back, thanks! <laughs> thanks for taking the time to share your thoughts. I was like, well, there's, also this, there's also like a, like a, a, a weird... Um, I don't even want to call it a trend, but a, a thing that I've been noticing lately on podcasts and in print interviews and things where it's almost like um, a check mark or a, on a checklist of artists, writers, creators to throw in that they're unhappy with their own stuff, right? Like mm -hmm. they'll promote it for 20 minutes, like, by th this is awesome. But you know, Rick, I'm not any good. Yeah. I'm just not any good. Like I hate all my own stuff. Like, <laughs> and, and, so it's like a I deviant do, art blog I post. That, <laughs> I do believe that there are people that are truly like that that feel that way about their own stuff. But it's almost getting to this like weird, like faux, over humble, self deprecating type of like thing where it's like, I like comic books are not cheap, right? Like every issue of Oz is three ninety nine. The hardcovers are thirty dollars. Um, I will never go online or on interviews and start telling people how bad it is. Like, <laughs> I can't do that. I can't ask you to, to spend money on this product that I've worked all year on. Now, do I think it could be better? Absolutely. It, everything could be better. But I, I feel that it's um, doing my job poorly. If I felt confident enough to take a paycheck, to buy my iMac, if I did all these things, from this thing, I can't then turn around and kind of beat myself up for it and then expect you to go into the wallet that you've worked so hard for and, and kind of give me that money. It's just a weird it's a it's a weird way to I think to interact with the fans and then you know so I, I try to keep that in mind all the time and make sure that I don't get sucked into that. Because it is easy. We we do spend a lot of time in rooms by ourselves, so it's easy to get trapped in that. All I could say is, Scotty, I, I hope you will promise to come on the show again because that was the most cheerful dressing down I've ever heard in my entire life where you were telling somebody, stop doing this crap, but you did it in this really smiley way of like, no, this is a bad thing to do and this is why. Uh, that was awesome. I think that's a good place to sort of wrap up on. I do want to throw a, a, a plug to one thing that, um, you know, one of the th ideas that I think that kind of was trickling through as we were talking about all this stuff was the idea of, the spirit of play being important in your work, playing around when you're doing this stuff. And and man, I wanted I wish we had more time to talk about Scatterwood because I thought that that was a really, really cool idea. That's at scottyscott.com. Mm -hmm. It's not finished, but you and Scott Morse did this really cool experiment where you were telling a story by trading off the pages. Yeah, we'll get back to it soon for sure. Like, like I said, we just kind of kicked that off right at such a bizarre time where I was trying to get my old house shut down, my new house open, my new yeah. studio open, family issues, all that kind of thing. So we kind of got that going at such a bizarre time. So we really hope to get that going again. But it was a fun thing to, to do where um, we literally just said we're going to do an animal book, fantasy book, and, and keep the panel count low. That way we can't, neither one of us can guide the story too much in one page. And then I do a page, 
give it to him. He does the next page, and we just see what kind of story we could tell. So it's it's fun. And then you're creating in public too, right? You know, you, people, you're opening up that process. This goes again to like when you're sharing your sketches and your stuff on Instagram and on Tumblr. Yeah. You're you're opening up that process, letting people see inside the behind the wizard's curtain, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, it you know. pulls back the curtain a little bit, and, yeah. and even for me, it helps me to go like, oh, look, this process it isn't as precious as we pretend it is. Like yeah. we are literally like, fo- you know, we're, we're we're making this thing seem like we plotted it out. We've got our index cards up on the wall, but really, it's like, oh, it's Tuesday. Let me check my email. There's Scott. <laughs> Oh, and there's there's Katie's dad calling. <laughs> <laughs> she warned me this would happen. <laughs> All right, well, um, we, we're going to shift gears and get Eli Nyberger in here to do some book recommendations. But before we do that, we have to say goodbye to Katie. And uh, Katie, I hope we can get you back, too, because yep. this was super, super fun. And uh, Katie, you can be found at katiekendraw.com. Mm-hmm. Katie can draw on Twitter. Yep. On Facebook, you're on Google Plus. I, I, yep. I, I see your face everywhere. Uh, everywhere. So, Gronkcomic.com is the one that's really important. Yes. People should click right now. Type and it into your browser. People should buy the book. People should buy the book that's in your store <laughs> at Big Cartel. Uh, we got a copy right here up on the screen that we can put maybe on the screen just for a second so everybody can know what they're looking for. You won't be sorry. Uh, four panel strip. It's mm-hmm. adorable. Absolutely Thank you. adorable. And uh, so. very funny, too. So. Thank you very much. Well, thanks for being here, Katie. Oh, thank thanks you. for taking time out of your day. Thank and, you. Okay, Bye. so um, I'm going to mention uh, a couple different uh, events going on. Yeah, you can just, you switch out while I do the events. And, uh, Scotty, I hope you'll stick around while, I, yeah. while Eli's here because we're going to do some book recommendations. Uh, events happening at the Ann Arbor District Library uh, very soon now. Sunday, February 5th, 2012, from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. at the Downtown Library Multipurpose Room. We've got Scott Yoshinaga and Audra Furuchi of NEMU, NEMU-NEMU.com, two exceedingly talented cartoonists who do a super, super fun comic called NEMU NEMU. They're going to be doing a presentation for us for the free Comics Artist Forum, a two-hour event that we hold once a month at the Ann Arbor District Library. And then I've got a class that I'm teaching this weekend on the 28th at the University of Michigan Museum of Art, a family comic jam from, I believe it's 1 to 4 p.m. Uh, details are on my site, comicsaregreat.com. Just look in the workshop section if you scroll down. So hello, Eli Nyberger. Hello, Jersey Drozd. How are you? <laughs> I'm doing okay. How are you? Doing great. What a killer show you've got today. This is, oh, this is it's, amazing. It's I'm all really the guests. It. I'm, just, I'm just facilitating. I am so not no worthy. Worries. It's just me. It's just me. <laughs> <laughs> So, so we, I've decided to bring something a little different today yeah. from what we normally talk about because it was such a great conversation today and especially the, uh, the, all the talk in the chat room about which really zeroed in on the how do you get stuff done? How do you find time? Especially you know, when you're managing either part-time jobs or kids or moving or any one of these things. So I drew upon uh, one of the great superpowers of your public library, which is that we have things that are no longer commercially viable. So there's some really great management books, time management books that are out of print because you know, self-help books typically have a shelf life of, you know, six weeks, something like that. Yep. But your library still got them, and there's a couple really interesting ones that are oldies but goodies, old enough that some of them still have the date due slips on the inside. Oh, wow. Use the stamp. But here's a good one uh, for getting started with this stuff, and this is called How to Be Organized in Spite of Yourself. Mm-hmm. And I like this title a lot. It's got a couple of good things, and what it focuses on, uh, the nice thing is time and space management. Now, some of these books are kind of <laughs> almost pre-internet, in terms of, you know, it's like it doesn't talk about managing your inbox because your inbox was something that held paper, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, but one of the things that I found about, uh, you know, some, uh, something in common behind a lot of people who really operate at high levels of productivity is that they use physical management methods to handle their digital inboxes, you know? And there's all the getting things done stuff, you know, the GTD crowd. Oh, yeah. Um, and there's some really good wisdom in this. So, you know, there's a couple sections here about uh, why people have an allergic to detail style and why people have overly detailed styles. And I think it helps a lot, especially for people who are getting started and feeling swamped by this stuff. So that's one good thing you can check out. And this is one that uh, I think a lot of, this tends to skew a little older than uh, sort of the beginning comic artist, but this is uh, breathing space, living and working at a comfortable pace in a sped up society. Mm. And what this is about is some of the stuff that we were talking about today, uh, finding time, for yourself amidst all this other stuff. Like Katie was saying, you know, finding dedicated time to socialize, you know, as a parent especially, it's like, you know, let's talk about something other than Dora for 10 seconds, please. <laughs> so this is a, I like this one a lot because it kind of, uh, 
it's very large type and very friendly to read and all that kind of stuff. There's, mm -hmm. You can see, again, it dates itself with Chapter 5, The Paper Trail Culture, featuring an opening quote from Lee Iacocca. But, you know, there's still there's some good <laughs> wisdom in this stuff. But especially in the channel, there were clearly uh, some people who were just getting started with this stuff and were looking at this. And this is a very teen-oriented book. It's really like a lot of it is about how to or have your room not be so messy. Mm. But, you know, for people who are getting started... <laughs> Um, <laughs> hey, look at Scotty's office. No, I don't want to see anywhere outside of this box right here. You, you just moved, dude. <laughs> well, but also, I mean, honestly, Scotty, your office is an after. You know, this is this is like you know. I, I think that your average teenager is trying to get to the level of organization we can see behind you. So, <laughs> so this is nice because it's written by a mom and a daughter together. So there's a little bit of uh, uh, reality injected into it. It's not your typical self-help thing, mm -hmm. but it has a lot of really nice tricks. And what I think is really interesting about this, especially for you know students in your classes and and people who are getting into this, is you get these habits routinized now you know when mm. you're when you don't really have things to do other than your schoolwork get yourself organized and routinized now and build those habits that'll then pay off oh whole, man that is a great point that i neglected your... to bring up during the discussion scotty i bet a lot of this comes down to, to fostering habits in in oh, your work day is it doesn't it huge like building habits uh are good and some are bad um but it's huge like uh I am at a place now where if I even think about leaving my house to get to the studio any minute after eight, I'm almost in a panic. Like I want to start right at nine o'clock or before, you know, like I don't want to start. Any so yeah, uh, even today I was like, Oh, I got to bring trail mix. Cause I usually go to lunch at 11 and I'm going to be doing this interview today. So like, I'm going to be so thrown off. Like, <laughs> um, no, I, I apologize to get to that place. But the habit thing is really big. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. And that's what some of these management uh, different techniques, like uh, I, I've talked about in some of the other shows that I do, the uh, Emergent Task Planner by David Say, which uh, people said, geez, that seems like a detailed way to go about your day. And I'm like, well, it's a concrete way for me to track what I'm doing. And the hope is that I'll form new habits by using this crutch for now, right? It's, yeah. So anyway, you had one more, Eli. Well, and there's actually one other thing, as you mentioned that, you know, there's oh. a lot of tools out there, but my very favorite tool for this, I don't know if we can really see it on the camera, probably not. Epic Win for iOS mm. is a task management app that kind of gamifies finishing your tasks. Epic you win. Get, you get experience points, you get gold, you get crazy treasures. I think the last thing I earned was, uh, <laughs> let me see what I can That's awesome. do with this here. You get like the plus six helmet of smart acidness. You know, I mean, they're, they're all making fun of Dungeons and Dragons stuff. Let me see what the last item was that I earned. Oh, the Lil Quill. The Lil Quill. Oh, if you're illiterate, but no one needs to know that if you keep this useful writing stick in your pencil tin, etc. So there's that's a really nice little task app, and it focuses on recurring at, uh, recurring tasks. So you can, again, have something helping you routinize that, get experience points for it. My dwarf is now level 10. He's a major dorm, <laughs> dwarven data miner. And depending on what type of tasks you get. So that's another great one. That's but pretty cool. But I wanted to have kind of a, a case in point for all of this. So I brought this, which is Shutterbug Follies by Jason Little. Mm -hmm. uh, it's from 2002, so it's not very new. But Jason Little used to work here at AADL mm. as a part-time person. And... He got his comics career started while managing a part-time job that was only tangentially related. And uh, you can this is a really great book if you're not already familiar with it. Um, it's basically a mystery that is revealed by someone who works at a instant film lab. So it's kind of dead, dated again yeah. as far as that goes. A period but, piece. A period piece. <laughs> but, you know, he's got kind of a very warish or wear, wearian, I don't know what you would say. Wear -esque. Uh, a wear-esque style. Um, it's is, a great book, but th you know this is the proof in the pudding of that did, you can really make it happen while you're doing. Did you say that else. was Fantagraphics? Uh, let's see. I think it is. Looks like a Fantagraphics yeah, book because sure that's not. I mean, that's no small shakes to get a Fantagraphics book published. Right. You know, so so oh, oh somebody's asking in the chat a what style? Chris Ware is who yes, we're Chris referring Ware. to. Uh, this is actually Doubleday, so it's oh, not Double Fantagraphics. Day. Well, still, yeah, you know, that's a still. beautiful looking book. Yeah, so it is. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know, Scotty, if you had any book recommendations that you wanted to throw out. I mean, we kind of talked about some earlier, sure. but if you wanted to give a plug to anybody, uh, this is your chance. Yeah. Help well, out a bro. I've got two. Um, the first one we, we mentioned earlier, which is uh, Tale of Sand. Uh, this is put out by Archaea. Um, this is actually um, based, or it's an adapted from a, a screenplay uh, that Jim Henson wrote, uh, but never filmed. 
uh, and they found it in the archives. So it's a full screenplay for a for a movie. And uh, one of my my good friends, Ramon Perez. Uh, oh took, God, he's awesome. Oh, he's amazing. Yeah, he is. Um, he basically took this and uh, adapted it, and it it it's one of the most. I mean, there's not even really words to really describe what he did with this. It's uh, it's just mind blowing. So this this is definitely one of the best books I've I think I've ever ha- got got my hands on. Wow, uh, Ramon just just like we, we'll talk about what he did in this book years and years and years from now. That's the level that he produced at. Um, and then uh, another one is from uh, Jason Brubaker. Mm-hmm. It's called Remind, yep. and he uh, – it's a webcomic. Uh, he did a webcomic, serialized it online, and then did a Kickstarter and put together and produced these this really, really nice hardcover. Um, it's a fun all-ages book. It's, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, interesting world they go to, the talking cat. The, the It's a really, really, really fun book by a great guy who's uh, – who's a pretty awesome do-it-yourself uh, artist, you know, putting out high-quality work online and in print, um, which I think you can get this at... Uh, remindblog.com. Is yeah, remindblog.com, and then uh, the books are on sale through Amazon. He sells them through Amazon. Um, so those would be my two book, uh, my book recommendations. Awesome. Well, thanks for that, Scotty. And I had one that I wanted to throw in this time because I just found this in the ADL collection, and I got super, super stoked. The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Ultimate Collection Volume 1, which uh, is the original comics that started it all by Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird. And uh, one of the things that caught uh, some of my friends off guard when they saw this stuff is just how raw some of those early comics look. But at the same time, it's like you look at it and all the layers they're doing with their mechanical tones, which they were doing by hand back then. Yeah. Um, and then plus, uh, the energy, the the raw energy that was in those old Turtles comics is so much fun to read. Uh, and, and plus, it's an important piece of comics history, too, to uh, mark a time where the, the black and white 80s boom happened. Uh, and the self-publishing boom happened in the early 80s, and which turned into a big licensing boom for Eastman and Laird. But beautiful, be- beautifully packaged book. Does this include the uh, the Mark Martin? You know, the, you know. Have you ever seen the two issues? Mm. I'm thinking of the right person. Uh, Mark Martin did these two issues of Turtles. They were like mm. kind of guest comics. Okay, Are you familiar? What I'm talking about. No, Maybe no. I'm thinking of the wrong person. No, but, uh, could be God, for all I know. But uh, there's also annotations in this in these collections as well, with like notes and sketches and thumbnails and thoughts from the creators. Uh, su- super cool reading, uh, and like I said, just like a really cool piece of comics history. Look at look at the look at that two page spread. Super fun. Okay, well, gosh, what a full episode we had today, and what uh, a, an enthusiastic chat we had today in the in the chat client. Oh my gosh, this is one of the best episodes ever. Scotty, uh, you, awesome. ha- you have an open door po- uh, invite to this thing because you brought so much energy and fun to this episode and I really appreciate it. Anytime, anytime. Um, <laughs> anytime I can interrupt your, your daily yeah, schedule. It's <laughs> so always more trail mix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my friends will tell you I'm, I'm quite the podcast uh, crasher. So. Oh, uh, oh, cool. Well, you, you can crash ours anytime. Uh, so Scotty, you can be found at scottyyoung.com. Uh, Scotty Young on Twitter, on Facebook, Google Plus. Uh, then also Scotty Scott is where people can catch up on more of. Uh, if you haven't checked out the uh, comic that you did with oh Scott Morse, uh, mm-hmm. yeah Scatterwood, uh, definitely check it out. It's it's, it's really beautiful. I, I hope you. this book gets finished because it's it's really fun to read. We will definitely be getting back to it. But in in the meantime, we can check out the Oz books from Marvel, right? For sure. Yeah, we got uh, all three of those. Wonderful Wizard of Oz. Uh, Marvelous Land of Oz and Ozma of Oz are all hardcover right now, and then uh, uh, working on the fourth one right now. Cool. Any other uh, appearances that you wanted to make any noise about, or just you, you'll be appearing on the Instagrams? Yeah, I'll be there, but in, in various conventions throughout the rest of the year and everything. But I, I can't remember. I'm at <laughs> all of them, I think. <laughs> Well, next time I'll get you on with Jake Parker, and we could do some more studio. Yeah, talks. I need to get on with my buddy. All right, cool. All right, well, thanks again, Scotty, for being a part of this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Eli, of uh, the Ann Arbor District Library. My pleasure. For putting on this show uh, twice a month. This is 
super super fun to do. So I thank thank you guys for the Trust opportunity you. and and for the new equipment. We got new mics today. That's which right. Is, oh gosh, feels so fancy now. They have that new mic smell. Uh, <laughs> any any uh, ADL events that I missed that you might want to make some noise about? Uh, well, the one thing for people who are listening locally, we do have Story Collider. Uh, is this uh, mm. tomorrow night, uh, which is kind of like Moth meets Nova is the way they tend to describe it. So it's a really great event, and that'll be at uh, the BTB Cantina uh, tomorrow night for those of you who are listening locally. And uh, then just stay tuned. And then we have uh, February 26th, the Double Dash Duo Derby Dinner. This is the triumphant return of Mario Kart Double Dash. Oh, and we cool. are setting up eight game cubes in a LAN network, which is an experience that very few people have ever Oh, had my gosh. Now, see, so, all you folks listening. That's who, what your library is, should be. Yes. <laughs> the, everybody who's not in the southeast Michigan area, that's what your library should be. If not, just I, one of my goals with this thing is to get more cartoons to emigrate to Ann Arbor. So come to Ann Arbor. Right. We have these, all these cool comics workshops, and then we can play Mario Double Dash. It's a cartoonist <laughs> mecca here. There's lots of coffee. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Lots of coffee, that's right. Uh, at Roos Roast, by the way, you should go there. Uh, so, okay, well, thanks everybody for downloading and listening. This will be at comicsaregreat.com slash CAG45 is where you'll be able to find the podcast afterwards and on YouTube. If you want to watch the video and see Scotty's handsome face and wild ham gestures. Je je gestures. And, uh, yes, so, uh, oh, and we're on Stitcher, too, now. So if you want to check us out and stream us, li uh, stream us on the Stitchers, you can use that app for your iOS or Android device. And we'll be back in two weeks on Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time at ComicsGreat.tv. Until then, I have been Jersey Droz of ComicsGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye.